The following program is sponsored by CBN. Coming up. It felt like it was Groundhog's Day. An unending cycle of drug abuse. It was the same thing over and over again. And he knew he was hooked. I just found out that I really liked methadone and fentanyl. If I wanted to relax or get some sleep, I would take a Klodopin or a Xanax. So how did he break the habit for good? And boom, I was face down on the carpet. Today on The 700 Club. Welcome, folks, to this edition of The 700 Club. Full speed ahead. The Senate is moving quickly to put Amy Coney Barrett on the Supreme Court. Two weeks from today, confirmation hearings begin. Democrats are desperate to stop the nomination. So what can they do? Absolutely nothing. White House correspondent Ben Kennedy reports. Amy Coney Barrett is President Trump's third pick for the high court. At 48, she's one of the youngest Supreme Court nominees in recent memory and could serve for decades. Hours after announcing his Supreme Court pick, President Trump touting he's fulfilling his campaign promise to appoint conservative judges. We have Justice Gorsuch, Justice Kavanaugh, and now we have Amy, along with over 300 federal judges by the end of this term. A devout Catholic, mother of seven, and former clerk for Justice Scalia, Amy Coney Barrett would give conservatives a 6-3 majority on the high court. I clerked for Justice Scalia more than 20 years ago, but the lessons I learned still resonate. His judicial philosophy is mine too. A judge must apply the law as written. Strong criticism coming swiftly from Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer, who says he will not meet with the nominee. Her views are way to the right of the American people, and as they learn about it, she will become less and less popular. The future for DACA kids and immigrants will be greatly hurt as well. Just about everything that America believes in and stands for when it comes to issues like health care and labor rights and LGBTQ rights and women's rights. Judge Barrett stands against all of that. Barrett has strong support from religious conservatives like Penny Nance with Concerned Women for America, who recommended he nominate Barrett. She's a woman who actually believes her faith, right? And that's why she was attacked when she was being confirmed for the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals by Dianne Feinstein. Dianne Feinstein had absolutely ripped her uh, by saying that the dogma, as in her Catholic faith, lives loudly in her. And since then, she's kind of taken on this cult status, if you will, among evangelicals and Catholics, pro-life Catholics. And, and so she's kind of been a hero to the right uh, after receiving that type of treatment from the Democrats. Democrats oppose her nomination, stating no Supreme Court justice has been confirmed this close to a presidential election. Democratic presidential nominee Joe Biden says the nomination is about targeting Obamacare and called on the Senate to wait until after the election to vote. It's no mystery about what's happening here. President Trump is trying to throw out the Affordable Care Act. But there's nothing Democrats can do to block the nomination. We can slow it down, perhaps a matter of hours, maybe days at the most, but we can't stop the outcome. The process is moving quickly, with the White House delivering paperwork today and meetings beginning this week. Nance says Barrett is ready to face Senate Democrats. We're going to work very hard to make sure that she is confirmed. And you don't know what they're going to throw at you, but I think she's more than ready because she's battle tested. She's already been through it. Barrett has already been vetted, so her nomination could move quickly. Senate Republicans hope to hold a final vote before the November election. Ben Kennedy, CBN News. The White House. Well, Amy Coney Barrett is a member of the non denominational group, denominational group called People of Praise. Now, here's how they describe themselves on their website People of Praise is a charismatic Christian communion, like hundreds of other, uh, millions of other Christians in the Pentecostal movement. People of Praise members have experienced the blessing of baptism in the Holy Spirit and the charismatic gifts as described in the New Testament. Wow. 
Absolutely. She's, she's a person who, you know, she, not her dogma, her faith yeah. is loud within but, her. You'd hope you know, so. I say mean, she, she's, I mean, she believes in the word of knowledge like we have here on this program. She believes in the gifts of the Spirit. I mean, who ever heard of a Supreme Court judge who believed in these things? And she is brilliant. That's the thing about her. She is a brilliant constitutionalist and studied with Antonin Scalia. Well, show your support for the constitutional confirmation process. Support a Senate vote to fill the current Supreme Court vacancy. Go to cbnfaithinaction.com and sign the online petition. And uh, it's to name your voice and let it be heard. And uh, th this is something, it's so important, but if the, the, they only need a majority, because they took the so-called nuclear option off the table, Harry Reid is responsible for that. So all they need is a, is a majority of the uh, senators, and uh, I think Lisa Murkowski uh, and Susan Collins have said that they wanted to hold up, but I'm not sure that even they, that, uh, Mitt Romney has said he will go along with voting, and, and I, I think probably Joe Manchin from West Virginia and others will come on. So. When it comes up for a vote, uh, it's, it's going to be confirmed, and they know that they can't stop it. But what a wonderful thing. This, this is going to tilt the balance on the court, and then there might well be one other, uh, others who, who would decide they wanted to get off, and then at that point, there might be seven to two decisions out of the court. Amazing, amazing what's happened in a, in a short period of time. It's a miracle. Well, another news. President Trump is pushing back against the New York Times over a report about his taxes. So how did the Times get a hold of those documents? You know, it's against the law. It is against the law to reveal somebody's tax returns. I mean, if the IRS reveals somebody's tax returns, they have broken a, it is a, a felony. So how did the New York Times get it, or are they fake? John Jessup has more on that. Matt, President Trump is dismissing the report that claims he paid only $750 in federal taxes in 2016 and 2017, and no federal taxes at all in 10 of the past 15 years. Fake news. No, actually, I paid tax. but And you'll see that as soon as my tax returns. It, it's under audit. Now, the president has never publicly released his tax returns, citing an ongoing IRS audit. The New York Times says it has obtained two decades of tax returns for the president and his businesses, but it hasn't revealed the documents yet to anyone. A lawyer for the Trump, uh, a lawyer for President Trump, rather, told the Times that most, if not all, of the facts in the story appear to be inaccurate, and that Trump has paid tens of millions of dollars in personal taxes to the federal government since announcing his candidacy back in 2015. The Times story comes out as President Trump and former Vice President Joe Biden are set to square off in their first presidential debate in Cleveland Tuesday night. Well, global coronavirus deaths are approaching 1 million. The world expected to pass that sad milestone today. More than 204,000 Americans have died from the virus. And now there are concerns that a second wave may be coming to this country and others. 21 states are reporting an increase in the new cases over the past week. New York City also seeing a surge in new cases, topping 1,000 for the first time since June. This as more than 500,000 city students are preparing to return to school this week. This may be the most precarious moment that we're facing since we have emerged from lockdown. We don't carefully follow the guidelines, the other guidelines, the masking, the distance, the crowds, that we may see another surge again. And over the past seven days, some Midwestern states have reported more than 25% of tests. Pat have come back positive for COVID-19. You know, it is a deadly thing. I was listening to an epidemiologist from uh, Johns Hopkins University, and he said that the amount of COVID that is needed comes about in closed spaces. That if you're outdoors, and especially wearing a mask, there's no problem. For example, if you have a football game and it's outdoors, there's no reason to have to just have a few thousand people in the stands. They could fill the place up if they're wearing masks. 
And he was saying that it's, it's in the enclosed spaces that if you go into a, a restaurant and you're all together, that's the danger. Uh, if you go into a bar and you're all together, you have a danger. It's inside, indoors, in small spaces, according to this expert. And I, I think he is on to something. And I think we're handling it wrong. But the idea of shutting everything down again would be disastrous. We absolutely can't do that. I mean, uh, the, the health risks and the other risks are just too uh, enormous. And I'm, I'm, I'm not sure the first shutdown was appropriate. But what we should do is not isolate the whole population, but we ought to isolate the vulnerable population, the people in nursing homes, the elderly, the people who have some pre-existing uh, illness, whatever it happens to be. Uh, they are the ones that ought to be quarantined, not the rest of the population. Yeah. And it's time we, we open the, you know, the, the governor of Florida is opening the place up. And I think he's, he's got the right thing. He said a lot of the statistics are off because they're showing every single death from every disease as part of the problem. And they're not just uh, COVID deaths, they're the deaths from everything. And he said, we're opening it up. And I mean, good for him. John? Pat, the pandemic is just one reason faith leaders are citing America needs revival. This weekend, two massive events brought a spirit of prayer and praise to the National Mall as believers ask God to forgive America's national sins. CBN's Paul Strand reports on the return and Washington Prayer March 2020. They call it the return because spiritual leaders believe pandemic, race riots, economic downturn and political turmoil are serious symptoms of a sick nation needing to return to God. We drove God out of our hearts, out of our government, out of our ways, out of our laws, out of the education of our children, out of the public squares. We deserve your judgment, Father, but we ask for your grace. We ask for your mercy return our love to you that will stand fearless in the face of evil. CBN's Gordon Robertson and his father, Pat, joined in. Lord, this is your world. This is your land. We ask you would come and heal our land and take charge. For Lord, we don't know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. At the same time, Franklin Graham led a prayer march that thronged the Lincoln Memorial and grounds around it with many tens of thousands of prayer warriors. Vice President Mike Pence and his wife joined Graham. On the president's behalf, I want to say thank you for your prayers. Not only for the first family and our family, but for all of those who serve in positions of authority. With the crowd too massive to gather around one figure, they broke into prayer circles all over the mall. My prayer is that all this craziness in 2020 just leads people to God and, and to question and to, to real life-changing power that I've experienced personally and I want it for everyone. These events and efforts were all to the same purpose, bringing America back to its first love, repenting before a holy God. Paul Strand, CBN News, reporting from The Return. Thanks, Paul. Pat, so encouraging and amazing to see so many people coming together for prayer. It was remarkable. I think it's, it's got historic significance. I was one of the three uh, coordinators of what was called Washington for Jesus. We had maybe a half a million or more people uh, out there on the mall, and it was fabulous. And we prayed, and God did a miracle. There was a dramatic shift in the government. There was a dramatic shift in the foreign policy of America. I mean, the whole country turned. And I believe that what's happened out there uh, on Saturday uh, with all this prayer, I think God is going to hear it, and we're going to see a dramatic change uh, in our society, and not only in our society, but I think the dictators of this world are going to be coming down. I believe that uh, we're, we're looking at four or five years of really, it'll be like paradise, because the devil is going to be bound for a time. And somehow, the, the dictators like the dictator of China and the dictator of um, uh, Turkey and places like that, they're going to come under the wrath of God, and God's going to, to destroy the destroyers of the earth. And in the next few years, we, instead of something really bad coming, I think something really good's coming. And uh, I think the Supreme Court is just one evidence. I mean, we may stop this awful slaughter of abortion. We've had 60 million unborn babies killed in America. and. Uh, there's a real good possibility with a shift of the Supreme Court that we could overturn Roe versus Wade, which was 
It was called Blackman's Abortion. It was based on faulty data. And uh, we, we just, uh, things are going to shift. And I think there's going to be a, a major shift in Congress, in the Senate, in the House. We, it's going to be a good thing. You know, we're looking at, at hope, not, not disaster. I think disaster was on the way coming into our society uh, with Antifa and the um, radical group called, that's got a name called Black Lives Matter and other groups like this that had communist uh, influence. I think the Lord is going to put an end to it, and we're going to see a period of blessing. And so that's that's my Amen. my happy word for today. Oh, we receive it. <laughs> Amen. That's okay. Great. What's next? Well, coming up, a deal with the devil, the untold story of Karl Marx. Did the author of the Communist Manifesto make a pact with Satan himself? And then later, talk about stepping out in faith. Meet the man who has walked across Niagara Falls and the Grand Canyon on a tightrope. Those stunts didn't scare him. So what did? Nick Walenda shares his story. An economic and social disaster in every country where it's ever been tried. Communism is intrinsically evil, and the devastation from communism reaches about 100 million dead people. So it's no surprise that its founder had a fascination with the devil. Karl Marx once wrote, quote, My soul is chosen for hell. Now a new book by Paul Kengor exposes the dark roots of this wicked ideology. Take a look. In his Communist Manifesto, Karl Marx called for a government in which the state owns everything, with everyone supposedly sharing equally in the benefits of labor through the redistribution of wealth. For more than a hundred years, Marx's communist ideology has been tried around the world and without exception has resulted in oppression, poverty, and death. In the 20th century alone, communist regimes led to the slaughter of more than 140 million people. Atheism is a core tenet of communist ideology. In a new book, The Devil and Karl Marx, author Paul Kengor suggests that for Marx, there may have been more at work than a rejection of God and religion, Marx may have made a pact of sorts with Satan himself. Well, Paul Kanger joins us now by Skype. Uh, Paul, uh, Karl Marx was born Jewish, converted to Christianity at some point in his life, and then rejected God completely. Why did that happen? Hi, Pat. It's great to be with you. Yeah, he, he rejected God when he went to college. <laughs> kind of the same old story. He had a a professor in college who taught systematic theology who was an atheist. So you can see not much has changed with our universities in 200 years. But And, and that professor, by the way, was very anti-Semitic. And Karl Marx, who came from a family of rabbis, became very anti-Semitic. And by the way, as I also document in this book, he was an out-and-out -out racist. And if there's one thing that I really like, I have the memoirs of Patrice uh, Colors, the founder of Black Lives Matter, she says that they spent a year reading Marx and Lenin and Mao, and, and she says she's a trained Marxist. I'd like her to know that Marx is a racist and an out-and-out -out racist who used the N-word often and in very vulgar ways. But unfortunately, so many young people today that have been educated by our universities, they know none of this dark, nasty side of Karl Marx. Oh, Paul, uh that beard of his, was that some kind of a satanic priest that there is it was a symbol with his beard? Yeah, I deal with it very carefully, Pat. I'm very careful about what I can say and what I can't say. I don't want to overstate things, but but his poems and his plays, they're chilling. I mean, that, that line that you quoted, that's from an 1837 poem, and he says, Thus heaven I forfeited, I know it full well. My soul, once true to God, is chosen for hell. And I also open up the book with another poem where he says, You, you see this sword, this blood-dark this blood sword, which stabs unerringly within thy soul. 
the Prince of Darkness sold it to me. And his poems, his plays, he writes about suicide packs, packs with the devil, destruction, despair. And I think this is really chilling, Pat. Two, two of Marx's daughters committed suicide in suicide packs with their husbands. They, 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 they took poison. Marx in his poems writes about suicide packs and pale maidens who, who, who kill themselves by taking poison. By the way, one of the suicide packs was uh, a son-in-law who was from Cuba. And so in Marx's word, that, in Marx's view, that meant that he had part N-word blood. He was partly Negro, as Marx put it. So Marx called him Negrillo, or the gorilla. And this poor guy was so abused and so insulted by Marx and Engels, he eventually took his own life in a suicide pact with Marx's daughter. Uh, Paul, uh, there's something called socialist, and we're running uh, uh, one political party in America that is embracing socialism. Uh, one of the big candidates uh, who dropped out was uh, an avowed socialist. As a matter of fact, he went to Moscow on his honeymoon. Uh, what is the difference between the socialists and the communists, according to Marx? Great question. Thank you for asking that. Yeah, according to Marx, according to Marx and Engels, according to Lenin, Marxist-Leninist theory, Marx said that, that socialism is the final transitionary step to full communism. So a friend of mine says, when he's asked the difference between a socialist and a communist, he says, well, as Christians go to heaven, a socialist goes to communism. <laughs> right. I mean, that's that's what they aspire to. That's their utopia, their their new Jerusalem. And, and it's it's funny, Pat, because, as you know, they're atheists. Right. Karl Marx said religion is not only the opiate of the masses, but the heart of heartless conditions, the soul of a soulless world, the sigh of the oppressed creature. He said communism begins where atheism begins. Lenin said all worship, be, worship of a divinity is a necrophilia. There's nothing more abominable than God. And yet, yet, they, they treated communism like a faith. In fact, I quote a, a letter between Engels and Marx where, where Engels says to Marx, he's talking about the draft of the Communist Manifesto, and he says, Carl, give a little more attention, if you would, to our communist confession of faith. I think we should drop the catechetical form and simply call it the Manifesto. So they use this kind of religious language. There's a lot of kind of chilling aping of God through, throughout Marx's writings, throughout Marx and Engels, and, and throughout communism. Oh. And again, our young people don't understand this. They don't understand that socialism is supposed to lead to have, communism. Have you found any reason why this thing spread so fast? I mean, we're talking about 100, 120 million people who've been killed because of Marxism. Why has it spread so fast? Yeah, it was never spread democratically. In fact, you know, the Bolsheviks took over in the Soviet Union, what would be the Soviet Union in 1917, Bolshevik Russia, and they used force. They used force and gulags. And, you know, Pat, young people, I'll speak around the country on topics like why communism is bad. And they'll come up to me and they'll say, well, you know, I hear the Communist Manifesto is a pretty good book if you just read it. And I'll say, why don't you read it and then come back and tell me that? There's a line in there. The entire communist program may be summed up in the single sentence, abolition of private property. And as soon as you hear that, I mean, you talk about going against biblical law, natural law, God's commandments, the Old Testament, the New Testament. If you, if you try to abolish private property, you're going to have to kill 100 million people, well, and, and, and which is why it's a mystery that it would ever spread that fast. I think the answer is not a rational one. I think the answer here is, uh, is a spiritual one. They, they wanted also to reallocate people, and they forced the people from the cities into the, into the countryside. Mao Zedong did exactly that in, in China. Yeah, and, and Pol Pot in Cambodia, the beginning of the movie The Killing Fields, when the people are walking out of the capital, Phnom Penh, going out into the countryside. And you know, Pat, that's actually point six in the 10-point plan of the Communist Manifesto, where Marx and Engels write about a more equitable distribution of the population across the countryside. They want, it's, right, it's right out of the book. They wanted to not only redistribute your property, they wanted to redistribute you. So it wasn't enough to take your stuff and take your churches. 
but but to but to spread people more equitably around the population of the countryside. And by the way, speaking of the churches, the longest part of this book is um, is not my part on my section on Marx. That's maybe around 120 pages, but the part on the infiltration of churches. And I really want this audience in particular to see how communists in the United States targeted the mainline denominations. They really went after the Episcopal Church, Presbyterian Church USA, and the United Methodist Church. And I quote Earl Browder, one of the leads, leading heads of Communist Party USA, speaking at Union Theological Seminary in 1935. He said, he said to these guys, you may be surprised to know that we have preachers, preachers active in the churches who are actual members of Communist Party USA. Actual members of Communist Party USA. Well, actually, uh, in, in Russia, uh, Archbishop Nicodem was was a dedicated communist, wasn't he? He was in charge of the Russian Orthodox Church. Am I right in there? He was. The Russian Orthodox Church was so co-opted by the Soviet government that they, they were real. They were forced to comply. And, and in fact, they really became I mean, I, I want to be careful. I say this because there are so many good people in the Russian Orthodox Church who resisted this. But they eventually came to a point almost of accommodation where I guess they felt that in order to survive and hold any services whatsoever, even with uh, official KGB church watchers sitting in the pews, that they had to simply um, accommodate and, and, and get along. But yeah, that was heavily penetrated, the Russian Orthodox Church. Well, Paul Kanger, thank you so much. The book is called The Devil and Karl Marx. Remember, we have a political party, the key leader of which uh, it was a dedicated socialist. He actually ran as a socialist. He, he was from Vermont. He and his wife had their honeymoon in Russia because they embraced communism. And they were one of the key factors in one of the major political parties in the United States of America. The one thing we don't want is socialism. And I, the nice thing about uh, the Hispanics in America is they have seen the devastation that's resulted in Cuba, uh, in Nicaragua, in Venezuela, with communism. And it, they don't want it here in America. And that's one of the reasons they're, they're voting uh, for Mr. Trump, because they don't embrace the socialism that is coming about from leaders in the Democratic Party. But this book is called The Devil and Karl Marx. Interesting book. And it's available wherever books are sold. Terry? For many who immigrate here, it's the reason that they come. To yeah. leave that behind and to embrace the freedom that we have Amen. here. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Well, we're just weeks away from one of the most important presidential elections in recent history. And we're asking you to join us in praying for our country. In order to do that, all you have to do is call our toll-free number and say, yes, I'm with you, 1-800-700-7000. Or if you prefer, you can go to PrayForAmerica.com. You can also text pray to 71777. And when you do, we're going to send you a Pray for America postcard. This is not just a pretty postcard. It's something for you to send to a friend and say, will you join me in my praying for this 40-day devotional? And then we're going to send you a Pray for pray America sticker, Pray for America bumper sticker, as well as a 40-day devotional. So please join us in praying for America. It's what that scripture that we've been talking about says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, seek my face, pray, and turn from their wicked ways. Be a part of this. Our goal is to cover our whole country in prayer, all 50 states, in the days leading up to this next election. So again, to join with us, just call 1-800-700-7000 or go to PrayForAmerica.com. And you can also text PRAY to 71777. And Pat, before we go on today, would you yeah. just pray for us? Pray, Let's lead us. Folks, mm -hmm. this is a crucial time in America. Uh, you know, they say this is the most important election, but we've got forces that want to destroy this country. I mean, they literally, you know, we, we mentioned the Marxist ideology. It has come out in, in, in ways that are just unbelievable. Antifa and this radical group that was formed, formed by three people who were trained as Marxists. God is on the throne, and we want to pray for this nation right now. Would you join Terry and me as we're going to pray together? Father, we pray for America. 
Lord, I thank you for the call. I thank you for Franklin Graham leading a large group. Your people are turning to you. And God, you don't want to give up on America. Lord, we know there's a lot of things that have been wrong here in America, but you, God, can change it. Mm -hmm. So right now, do a miracle for America, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And amen. amen. Mm -hmm. Terry. Well, coming up, man on a wire high above a fire. Meet the daredevil who walked on a tightrope over an active volcano. How did he do it and why? But first, Adderall by day, Xanax by night. This dad was popping pills around the clock and he couldn't stop. So how was he able to break years of addiction in an instant? You'll see, it's all coming up. John Humphreys was a walking drugstore. <laughs> Methadone, fentanyl, Adderall, and Zantex, you name it, John took it. For years, he couldn't get off the drug merry-go-round. And then, boom, his addiction vanished in an instant. Well, how did he do it? Just watch. Good. It felt like it was Groundhog's Day. It just continued. You woke up if you slept, and it was the same thing over and over again, but you're still searching for, oh, the, you know, maybe this time it'll be different and more fun or more of an event. But it became, to me, it was just a very hollow life. John Humphrey says he had a normal childhood in the Midwest, but in high school, he started experimenting with drugs to fit in. When I got into high school, I started experimenting with alcohol, I, th I believe first, and uh, started smoking weed. I think, I, you know, like every other kid, you're trying to figure out who you are. And I just, my perception of myself was I liked myself better when I was using, or maybe I had more self-confidence. John's family tried to intervene, but he dropped out of high school and left town. He started sleeping on friends' couches and worked menial jobs while his drug use increased. A few times a week, we'd have a bunch of people over, you know, snort some coke, drink some Crown Royal shots, and just have a full-blown party. He wasn't sleeping very often. And at this point, I'm pretty sure that I had a dependency to it. If I didn't before, this was the season where that just it kind of turned a lot uglier, and I realized that I was agitated when I couldn't get it, and I was it was all I could think about. John continued to pursue new highs and found it in pharmaceuticals. But I found out that I really liked methadone and fentanyl, so those were like my preferred drugs, and I was starting to use those on a regular basis. If I wanted to clean the house, I'd, I'd snort an Adderall. If I wanted to relax or get some sleep, I would take a Klodopin or a Xanax. He continued partying and had a baby with his girlfriend, which made him think about who he had become. There was a little ray of hope and light in a dark world for me when she was born. But I also remember holding her just thinking like, I am not a good enough person to raise a child. They had another child together and John started using even more drugs to cope with parenting responsibilities. With his relationship in turmoil, John faced a tough decision. Things at home weren't getting any better and I knew that I had to go, but in order for me to go and try to get sober and find my freedom, I had to uh, leave the place where my girls were at. And it was the most heartbreaking moment of my life. Feeling like there was no hope, his brother invited him to church, and John started reading the Bible. I started to read um, in Matthew, and I got past all the begottens and all that stuff, and I was reading about Jesus, and I thought it was a cool story. But I realized when I was reading this book, I just felt peace, and I thought maybe it was just because I was so focused on the book, but it was, a, it was a supernatural peace whenever I would get into it and read it. John sought refuge with extended family and had friends texting him scripture when he found his faith. I started to hear testimonies. Actually, I heard one on the 700 Club, and this guy said that he was so tired of, uh, I believe it was a heroin addiction, that he just threw his hands out and he cr cried out to Jesus and Jesus took his addiction away. And I thought it was the most ridiculous thing I had ever heard in my life. 
I was like, well, you know, where do they find these people? And I caught another testimony about somebody getting freed from addiction. And I thought, well, you know, maybe that happened, but it wasn't, they, they weren't as bad as me. But God was working on my heart in that time. So I was reading the Bible and I happened to have this thing on TV saying, you know, there is freedom when you call out to Christ. I knew that I, I didn't know how to handle this hopeless feeling inside of me or this brokenness inside of me or the uncertainty of what was about to happen. And I was like, you know what, Jesus Christ, uh, I want to believe and, uh, you know, I would love to believe this is real, but, you know, I just don't. But I've tried everything else. And if you're real, and I put my hands out, I was just like, if you're real, I need you now. And boom, I was face down on the carpet in the presence of Jesus Christ. I just remember trying to tell him, like, you don't know how bad I am. You don't know the stuff that I've done. And every time I would bring up a thought or anything like that, I just felt him reach into me and just grab that out. Uh, and, you know, like, this is mine now. And I was just, I had never experienced a love like that and a peace like that and all of that um, anxiety and worry and brokenness and heartbreak was just healing right in front of me. John says he stopped using all drugs and miraculously has had no withdrawals. Never touched the methadone again. Uh, pretty, I was off everything. Started going to church, went to a Celebrate Recovery the Friday, you know, three or four days after that. Today, John has reunited with his daughters and now ministers to drug addicts. I have custody of my daughters. I have a job where I actually help other people in recovery and trying to find sobriety. Jesus Christ is my savior. He's my rock and it's not that I've been perfect and every time something comes up, I find myself running back to him. He is a good father. He shows us our identity and, and he still is doing miracles in this world. And uh, there is not a more powerful force in this world than experiencing him. He came down when I had nothing to offer him. I've never had let less in my life to offer anybody. And he said, I'm gonna take this one and I'm gonna do something with this one. And I was the one that he left the herd for. Um, and that's the kind of father he is. He is love. He is perfect love. John Hoffers has got the answer. Jesus is perfect love. You know, he said, come unto me, all ye who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly, and share the burden with Jesus Christ. Now, John was into drugs beyond anything you can imagine. But folks, right now, I'm here to tell you, Jesus Christ will take the burden. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. But the reason it's light is because he's carrying it. Now, do you want to be free? He made you to be have dominion. He made you to have dominion over the plants and the vegetables and the uh, other things in, the, in this earth. But are you going to be a slave? to chemicals, to vegetables, to things that grow like cocaine, and plants? Are you going to have dominion? And right now, I ask you to stand up and be tall and to take upon you the goodness of God. Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden. What is the sorrow in your life? What burden have you been carrying? What sin have you done that you're ashamed of? What is it in your life? The Lord is looking into you. He knows deep into your heart and soul right now. He knows everything about you. You're not playing games. You can't be hidden from. He knows everything that you're thinking, and he knows everything you've done. And he still says, I died for you. You, now, right now, I want you to bow your head wherever you are. Pray these words. Pray them with me. Do it. Lord Jesus, that's right. Say it with me. Lord Jesus, I am a sinner. You know what I have done. You know everything about me. 
you look deep into my soul. You know all about me, and you still love me. And I thank you for that love. Lord, fill me with the love of God, for God is love. And I ask you to come into my heart right now. Fill me with your power. Take away the sin that's there. Cleanse me, Lord. And from this moment on, I am yours. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for hearing my prayer. Now, I want to pray for you right now, Father, for those in this audience who have been set free at this moment. I pray for the anointing of the Holy Spirit to come upon them. I ask for the anointing of God to come in their lives. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Now, if you prayed with me, I'd like you to do something, if you would. I just want you to pick up the phone and call. You, know, well, you say, why do you have to do that? Well, the Bible says if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. So you confess it. And there's somebody on the phone who's had the same experience you have right now who will rejoice with you. And it will just help solidify you. I've got some literature I'll have send you if you like. You don't have to give us your name if you won't, don't want to. If you do, I'll, I'll get you this. It's 1-800-707-1000. Toll-free number. Just pick up the phone and say, look, I just prayed with that guy on TV. I prayed with Pat. And I feel like the love of God is coming into my life. I've received Jesus as Savior. And I want to go from here. 1-800-700-7000. Okay? Write it down. 1-800-700-7000. And say, I just accepted Jesus as my Savior. And the angels of God are rejoicing because of this decision you made. Terry? Well, still ahead, a member of the world-famous Walendas. Millions have seen him perform stunts like walking across Times Square on a tightrope. But what happened when this world-famous flyer fell flat? Well, you'll see. That's next. And then get ready for another round of your questions and some honest answers. Sue writes, I think if you get saved and get out of the will of God, then you give up your salvation. What do you say, Pat? Pat will weigh in on that and more, so don't go away. Welcome back to Washington for the CBN News Break. Some Minneapolis City Council members who pledged to defund police are now changing their tune. In May, nine council members voted in support of a pledge to defund police after the death of George Floyd. In July, the city agreed to a plan moving $1.1 million from the police force to the health department for violence prevention. Now residents of some neighborhoods are complaining about rising crime and lack of response. That is some council members parsing their words. One says he supported the pledge in spirit, but not the letter. Another said the wording of the pledge is up for interpretation. Well, turning now to South America, where the Bible Society of Bolivia, in celebrating their 46 years of ministry, teamed up with CBN to produce a Zoom event featuring Superbook. The event was open to 500 families and aired simultaneously via Facebook Live in Bolivia, Venezuela, and Ecuador. As a result of the great response, the Bible Society of Bolivia will plan more events like these to share the gospel. Super Libro airs nationally in Bolivia on UNITEL. The Bible Society of Bolivia regularly promotes the airing to families looking for inspirational content that teaches the Bible. Well, you can find out more about what CBN is doing around the world by going to cbn.com international. Pat and Terry will be back right after this. Nick Walenda has been crossing a high wire since he was two years old. His death-defying stunts have earned him a place in the Guinness Book of World Records several times over. Once, he was hanging from a helicopter by his teeth. So you might think Nick is fearless, but you'd be wrong. Aerialist Nick Walenda is known for pushing the envelope. His televised walks over Times Square, Niagara Falls, the Grand Canyon, and most recently, an active volcano takes stepping out on faith to a whole new level. Yet this king of the high wire had never experienced fear until a tragic accident in 2017 that changed his life forever. In his book, Facing Fear, Nick shares how he got back on the wire and how you can face and overcome your fears. 
Well, Nick Walenda joins us now via Skype. And Nick, we welcome you back to the show. Thanks for having me on again. Well, let's go back, if we can, to your walk across the Messiah volcano. The microphones picked up your voice singing. What was going through your mind as you did that? Well, you know, the Bible says that God will bring us a peace that passes all understanding. And the reality is whenever I'm in any stressful situation, I praise the name of Jesus. You know, I'm constantly with prayer and thanksgiving, thanking God for the incredible opportunities and the platform that he's given me, even when I'm amongst uh, over a volcano on a wire. Well, obviously, you need to have superhuman balancing abilities to go across the high wire anywhere. But what are some of the other considerations that you need to take into account? With a volcano, I would imagine it was incredibly hot. Yeah, it's quite complex. In fact, I have an incredible team of engineers and scientists that work around me that uh, kind of that do studies and basically let me know what kind of heat I'll be facing, uh, what kind of movement the wire will have under my feet, how how heavy the gases will be. I had to wear a, a gas mask for that mm. walk. I had to wear goggles to protect my eyes. In fact, that sulfuric gas got so bad days up leading up to that walk that some of my stabilizer cables snapped because the gas was so thick. Wow. Well, in 2017, I know you and your family were rehearsing a pyramid act, which your family is famous for, and tragedy nearly struck. Well, it did strike. Walk us through what happened there. Yeah, so in 2017, we were trying to break our own world record by doing the highest four level eight person pyramid on the wire. And as we were training, uh, a long story short, two days before, rehearsing and that pyramid collapsed and uh, five of my family members fell to the ground. By the grace of God, I caught the wire, which is what I've trained to do my entire life, as did my cousin and one other gentleman. But my family members were injured pretty severely. In fact, my sister had broken every bone in her face. She currently has 73 screws and plates in her face alone. You know, what we know and what we've learned through faith and through our lives is that whenever we are down, whenever we are in a dark place, that God is up to something good. And we held on to that even in this time where we didn't know my sister was going to live. I do remember my sister coming out of a coma days after that accident, and she couldn't talk because her jaw was wired shut. And she just wrote that God's going to get the glory somehow out of this. She couldn't talk, but she wrote that because mm. she knew that this that God was at work at this moment in our lives. That had to have a strong impact on you, just being a part of watching that whole thing fall. Yeah. You differentiate between two types of fear, healthy fear and unhealthy fear. What do you find separates the two? Yeah, look, it's certainly a fine line and no pun intended, but you know, there's a healthy fear that tells us, hey, you better train and prepare and you better have a great team around you before you get on that wire. Uh, you know, there's an unhealthy fear that tells us not to pursue our dreams, to not to pursue our calling that God has for us in our lives. You know, we all have that, uh, that analogy, you know, that analogy of the devil and the angel on each shoulder. And the reality is that is so true in our minds. And, and through this process, I've learned that, that look, we can control where our minds go by the grace of God. You know, I, the Bible says to give all of our thoughts or make our thoughts known to him uh, for he loves us. And that's what I had to learn more than anything through this accident was as I was reliving that accident over and over again to the point where it became debilitating, where I didn't think I could ever get on the wire again. Uh, I had to remember to give my thoughts to God. Yeah. How did you practice that? You know, it was just that. It was about practicing it. It's just like getting on that wire. When I train, I train to walk on a wire that is five times longer. It's it's there's more heat in the heat suit that I wear and and, and I wear an oxygen deprivation mask, etc. Or I did for that volcano. Well, it's the same with with dealing with these thoughts that we have that go through our minds. Look, for some reason we're prone as human beings, our minds often go to negative thoughts. But the more we practice stopping those thoughts and cutting them off and encountering them with something positive, uh, the more we do that, the more natural it becomes and the more positive our lives become. Wow, we've seen you do so many amazing things. What's next? Do you have something in the wings? I am working on several things, I'm working on a big walk in the UK, which has been a dream of mine for a long time. And then the big one that I'm working on is something in outer space. Wow. <laughs> okay. We'll watch for that. <laughs> I want our viewers to know that you can read more stories from Nick's career, and they are amazing, by getting his brand new book. It's called Facing Fear, and it's available in stores nationwide. Nick, you're an inspiration. Thanks for being with us.
Thank you so much for having me again. Absolutely. Wow, what a guy. Huh? Yeah, I've watched some of those walks and you, 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 your heart's up in your throat as you <laughs> yes. see it. Okay. Some Time questions. for some questions. You All ready? Right, this is Sue who says, people say once saved, always saved. I think if you get saved and get out of the will of God, then you give up your salvation. What do you say, Pat? Well, I, I don't think it's what I say or you say is what God says. And uh, he says, uh, you know, uh, that the Lord will keep you, the Father will keep you, and nobody can take you out of his hand. Uh, I, I think that the idea of once saved, always saved is one of those things where you're presuming on God. And I don't think that's what it is. But, I, you know, look at David. When you read, I mean, he not only had an adulterous affair, but he killed a, a, a woman's husband. And he said in his Psalms, you know, restore to me the joy of my salvation, but take not your Holy Spirit from me. I believe that, you know, when we're adopted into the family of God, that's pretty much a permanent thing. But I don't think we ought to presume on it, okay? Amen. All right. This is Ray who says, what exactly is the spirit of Jezebel? And can a man have a Jezebel spirit? <laughs> Jezebel you know, was one who was uh, soliciting uh, uh, you know, Ahab, he, he was an awful person, and uh, she's the one that set up the murder of uh, somebody, you know, for example. Um, but she was horrible, and I think the spirit of Jezebel is the spirit of adultery, is the spirit of fornication, is the spirit of, of animosity to God. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I'm sure that a man could have a Jezebel spirit, too. Mm -hmm. Hey, right. This is Walter who says, Pat, what's the connection between Abraham being told by God to sacrifice Isaac and God sacrificing his only son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus? Um, I, I think that uh, in, in that uh, there's a similarity. Uh, but the, the, the sacrifice was not Abraham so much as it was Isaac. And Isaac was more of a type of Christ. But God gave his son and he asked Abraham to sacrifice Isaac and, of course, he stopped him from doing it, but he said, you, you didn't withhold your son, and therefore I'm going to bless you. We leave you with these words from Isaiah. Don't be afraid, for I am with you. Don't be discouraged, for I am your God. Well, tomorrow we've got a fascinating book about ending Alzheimer's, and you'll hear how you do it. It's a marvelous book with Dr. Bradison. I look forward to talking to him. For Terry and all of us, we'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.